Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. When I uh, begin, whenever we're, uh, I'm studying a passage of scripture, I try to pretend, what if I just found this on the ground, like this section? What do I see? Um, just to get my eyes open to like new, fresh things. I don't know what you heard when she was just reading that, all of that, but there's some crazy things happening in the world in this. No? John's baptizing, he's repenting, Jesus gets baptized. And the part that jumped out to me, he is hanging out with wild beasts. Nothing. How many of you think, oh, the reason that's cool about Jesus, he hung out with wild beasts. Don't worry, we're not going to do a whole sermon. I watch enough shows where like alone, you ever seen alone? Like they're often alone. And they're not just there to hang out with wild beasts. They bring things to kill the beasts. Or like life below zero, anybody like, yeah, I just waste my time doing a lot of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying, he hung up. There, there must have been conversations around the campfire. Jesus, tell the one again when you were with, I don't even know what wild beasts are out there. Let's just make them up. Polar bears. You're like, there's no polar bears in it. Prove it to me. <laughs> Jesus could have created one and then hung out with them. All sorts of things. I'm just saying. But the original audience and reader would have heard some amazing declarative statements beside that one. They would have heard something that Mark starts coming out of the gate pretty fast. You see, a big difference between Christianity and other philosophies of life, whether they're religions or just ways to think, is other philosophies of life point you to, here is some advice on how your life can be better and you live your most fulfilled life. Following Jesus and Christianity as a, as a faith essentially is news. Like this is what happened. This is good news, sometimes challenging news, but it's not just advice on how to get God's attention. It's news of how God already has your attention. The news is he wants your he wants you to see him and what he's doing. That's why it's so essential for us to actually see and hear what he said and what he did as a part of the source of these news. Let's just pray together as we get into this. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for as we gather together as the, your body, as your church. I pray that as we dive into this gospel, this unique writing, it's not an exercise of the head. It's not the exercise of like, I know this piece, I know that piece. That we even let go of the view that we have of you and hear something new and fresh. Hear something new. Align ourselves with you. God, speak to us today. Move in us today. We love you. In your name. Amen. There are certain movies, there are certain directors that have a tendency to come out of the gate quick. Like the movie starts with an action scene. So many of the James Bond movies start with his escaping from the previous thing. You know, like, what is going on here? There's a movie, The Dark Knight. No, no, if you saw it, but it starts with like a bank robbery and people all over the place, and you're trying to figure out what is happening. Mark comes out of the gate, and in fact, Mark's whole gospel is like this. If you haven't read one a gospel yet, if you're not reading scripture, this is why we're jumping into Mark, because it moves. So just think about what we just read. Mark makes a huge declarative statement about Jesus being something, being the Christ, being the head, being, being the king, being the Messiah, which we'll get into more. And then he jumps in quickly to this guy named John, who's obviously wearing something different than what is normal because he gets called out. He's wearing camel hair and some kind of leather belt. I'm not sure if everybody else was wearing like 100% cotton, probably not. They had their own outfit, but he was wearing something different. And he's out in the wilderness. Most evangelists go to the cities. They go to where people are. He's saying, nope, you're coming to me. Now, it also says people are flooding to the wilderness. To hear what? To hear a message about repentance. To go hear what they're doing wrong. 
I don't know about you, I'm not often drawn to like, I'm going to go hiking for a long time from the city to the wilderness to hear a guy in camel's hair to tell me what I've been doing wrong. But they're drawn to him. And he's preaching a message of repentance. And people are getting baptized. And then we see Jesus, the Son of God, who had nothing really to do with repentance, show up. And he gets baptized. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and God starts speaking out of the clouds. But then Mark says immediately he gets conned into the wilderness to meet Satan, like, like Satan, Satan. In this gospel, he doesn't talk about much what's happening there. You can go to Matthew and Luke, but then it says Jesus came out of the wilderness. So we pretty much know who won that confrontation. And then Jesus moves on in, into a next phase where he's like, I'm going to start really telling you something. He makes his declaration now that the kingdom of God is here. And that's how this gospel starts. There's no slow roll up. There's no character development. It's news. It's explosive news. But let's stop for a second. Pull back and go, what are the actual words that are being said here? In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, he says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a fascinating way of starting something. You probably don't read many books that say, this is the beginning of the book. It's not really a grabbing line. But he says that, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning. When the original reader, you're going to hear me say this a lot because that's how we got to look at Scripture. When the original reader says, what comes to mind when you hear in the beginning? Genesis. You're like, I told you. Maybe every week we're going back. You're like, we've heard enough. No, you haven't. You got like a decade more of me. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. You're like, oh, you got maybe 10 days. <laughs> the beginning. And it's a weird way of starting a book, but the original ears would have heard something awakened them in another book. Yeah, Genesis, in the, beginning, well, in the beginning, God created. Another gospel writer, John, does the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It pulls us. If you start with Jesus just as a story in itself, you're missing what's happening. God initiated life. He also initiated redemption and reconciliation. So Mark is saying this, this is the new beginning or the continuing of the beginning or how things were meant to be in the beginning. And what's so interesting about this book, and it's probably part of the tension in this book, is that we know from the very first time who Jesus is, the very first line, we're told who Jesus is, but nobody else in the story knows this. We get to see it, the reader gets to see it, but this is the tension. As this book unfolds, nobody else gets it. So this is who he is, and why does he do that? It's so that we can know. We can know who he is. And my hope isn't that what we currently think of Jesus today on June 12th, 2022, that we just bring that into this look that we bring that into this series or this immersion into the book of Mark. Because we've brought a lot of things and we add a lot of things. This is what it means to follow Jesus. We just do, don't we? Like this is what you get. This is what it's like. This is how to think. But we hope to use this series and this teachings and these kind of things jumping in as kind of a level set. Let's level set ourselves on how we're looking at Jesus. My challenge for me and you is that we would come open-handed and look for who Jesus really is. Look at what he actually said. Look at what he actually did. And then we'll really know what it means to follow him. As we go through kind of a foundational talk today, which may not be exhilarating, but it is so important to understand, you might hear some things from the Bible that we're not used to hearing, to be challenged around some things about how Jesus is actually asking you to follow him. But let's keep looking at this phrase, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel. 
Evangelion, it means good tidings. The original reader would have known this because this same phrase was used for like, let me share you about the gospel of Caesar. It's like, these are the works and good news of how great this king was. That's what they would have heard, they would have seen. And so often when we hear the word gospel, potentially, you know that it means good news, but you might also think, yeah, that means that Jesus came, he died, and he rose again for you. That's the gospel. Jesus had not done any of those things yet. And he himself said, I'm bringing you the gospel. So Mark starts, here is the good news. Here are the things about Jesus. Mark is connecting Jesus to a ruler in the very first line. He's doing this at the beginning. It's not a spoiler alert. It's often how a movie would end, right? And it does. It's like, this guy came out of nowhere and he's in the world. All of a sudden, he becomes the king. Jesus, I mean, Mark doesn't want you to be any confused about who Jesus is. He is this. Now let me show you how it happened. Christ. Christ is not a title. It's not his last name. I mean, it is a title. It's not his last name. It means Messiah in Greek. It means ruler. So every time you say Jesus and you say Jesus Christ, you're literally saying Jesus is the king. Jesus is the Messiah. It's a declaration of who he is. Son of God. Son of God. I mean, that's the very phrase that got Jesus killed. And yet Mark starts with it. Mark lets that out. So the opening statement really is this. Here are the good, royal things that King Jesus, the God-man, did. That's an intro. I mean, we could just stop there and go, man, Jesus the King, the God-man. It's like some kind of superhero movie, isn't it? The God-man showed up. (laughs) And Jesus shows up and basically says, I'm the God-man. You're like, you're a freak. I'll show you. We see that John, this guy named John, Jesus' cousin most likely, who actually when the mothers met and they were both pregnant, John leapt in his mother's belly upon meeting Jesus in his mother's belly. (laughs) It's a unique scenario. John chose a path an incredibly unique path. I don't know why he chose this path, but he was a renegade. He's like, I'm not gonna eat what people eat. I'm not gonna preach what people preach. I'm not gonna wear what people wear. And they're gonna come to me. But he's preaching this idea of repentance. I think we all know what repentance means in our heads to turn away from the old life, to turn away from things that we shouldn't be doing, don't wanna do, and turn back. It's a reversal of direction. And there's people being baptized out of obedience of this returning of direction. But then Jesus comes out to be baptized too. Why? Why would Jesus make that move? I mean, let's think about it. Everybody else was drawn to it. They're hearing about it. They're like, yeah, I too. See, baptism wasn't a new thing for Jewish people at the time. For most of them, they had an annual kind of consecration of their bodies where they would be cleansed. They got this. They understood this. What was new for them was that John was saying, not only do the Gentiles need to be baptized, because they often, if they were to convert to Judaism, would go through this whole process. But John's telling the Jewish people to be baptized for their repentance of sin. It's something new. And they were doing it. And then Jesus shows up. This this just sits with me. This is another one of those things like he's baptizing for repentance and there's a man who needed no repentance. Shows up. And we're seeing in the other gospels there's this conversation where John's like, I'm not gonna baptize you. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're gonna baptize me. He's like, no, I can't even like tie your shoes. You know, like you should be baptizing me. And Jesus is like, nah. You're baptizing me. I mean, this is my own alliteration. It's like the original Greek. Would it actually? No, it doesn't actually say that. But they're in like this conversation. For 30 years, Jesus was in Nazareth, which is a know-nothing town. 
being raised by a carpenter, so it probably was a carpenter. I mean, for 30 years, Jesus was just doing what he was doing. But he made a decision. He said, this is the point. This is the time. I am now going to start the ministry for all of you. It was an intentional choice. Jesus initiated this. This is another thing that is so different than so many philosophies of life that you have to behave in such a way to get God's attention. Yet the very beginning of Jesus' ministry is him going to somewhere to reveal that I am in this with you. How did he do that? John baptized him in the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. And the full immersion is that I am, uh, this is who I am identifying with my death. I'm identifying with my sins. And then when you come out of the water, it's like, I am a new person. Jesus came and his baptism was, I'm identifying myself with the brokenness of the people that I came to save. I now am identifying with you. I'm a part of this death. It's a precursor to his actual death. And then he comes out. You see, when Jesus comes up, the spirit comes down. It's just what happens. It's what we're now living in. So Jesus comes back up out of the water. In another version of the Bible, it says the heavens were ripped apart because it's now coming back together. There's another time when these things happened. At the very beginning of the world, God was the creator. The spirit hovered over the waters and the earth was created by the word. The triune God was a part of creation. It was his project of creation. And the triune God has shown up again. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son and who I am well pleased. This is a powerful moment. Have you ever thought about why is Jesus getting baptized? Jesus is getting baptized to say, I'm all in. I'm in with you guys. I'm identifying with you. The end result's just different. This is the invasion of the kingdom of God on this planet. This is the invasion of God's movement on this planet. You see, Jesus then makes this statement that launches the rest of Mark and it's where I want us to sit for a few minutes this morning. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's Jesus' opening sermon, statement. He's gone through all of these things, and then he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, if this was the full length of sermons in churches today, church would be a lot shorter. You're like, hey, here, here, I'm in. <laughs> Jesus didn't want to confuse people. That's a big statement, though, if we let it be. The kingdom of God is at hand. In the book of Genesis, we know this in chapters 1 and 2, that the earth was created with the kingdom of God and the earth being united. There's an intimacy, God walking with man, walking in the garden with man. But we see in chapter 3, this choice that was made by humanity, this choice of pride, this choice of self-centeredness. What do I get out of this? What benefit is this? There's a doubt that's caused by Satan. Said, did God really say that? He doesn't want you. He wants you to, to fall short of what life can really be like for you. So it's this choice of self-centeredness that pulls us away. And even though I thought that Jesus hanging out with the beasts was pretty cool, this really is the big statement. The thing that we have longed for, the things that we pray for, is here. You see, what Jesus said is a culmination of thousands of years of promise, of, of prophecy. The time is fulfilled. They've been waiting for this for thousands of years since Genesis 3, since the sin of man. And the prophets kept talking about it, and he steps into this. This was a mind-blowing moment if they let it be. 
I wonder how many people heard Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, show up and go, hey, the kingdom of God is here. And they're like, yeah, 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 I've heard this before. I know the prophets. He's like, no, no, right now. How often we can take our preconceived ideas or confirmation bias, if you will, and hear something and go, yeah, I know that. But what I think what Jesus is saying, are you living this? What difference does it make to you that the kingdom of God has arrived? You see, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus is like, I'm stepping into that space. It's that space we talked about last week where God would show up periodically because I'm in that space now. I'm in that space where you're going to see something amazing happen. And his message was one to draw people into that kingdom. But here's the issue. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's a different kingdom. And nobody realized it. You see, for the first eight chapters of Mark, and this is like a little bit of an overview, we see some amazing things happen. What happens when the kingdom of God has invaded a broken, sinful world? The first eight chapters of Mark talks about that. We see demons cast it out. You know what the unique part is? At the very beginning, I said that, like, we know as the reader, who, this is who Jesus is. Nobody else knew who he was, except there's one group that actually knew who he was. It's the demons. I mean, if you read this, the demons are like, Jesus, son of God. They're the only people who knew. People, or whatever they are. You know, floating around with horns and tails. Just joking. There's a little bit more to it than that. But the, the kingdom of God, the first chapter is... Demons are being casted out. People are being healed. Storms are being, cal- uh, being calmed. Everybody's anxious except for Jesus. The first eight chapters of Mark, you're going to see this is everything that we pray for today. God, I pray for healing. God, I pray for peace. God, I pray for my anxiousness to be gone. God, I pray that you show our, myself, myself, yourself. God, I pray that you come alive. The first chapter, eight chapters of Mark is everything that you pray for. But then there's this turn. It's a turn that we're not super excited about a lot of times. It's a turn towards what Jesus is really asking us to do. He asks, there's this point in in chapter 8. Where he asks Peter something so unique. and, And they've heard some of these messages They've heard him say, repent and believe in the gospel. They've seen him do these amazing miracles. They've said, what is it that Jesus, you're saying to us? You see, there's this issue that Jesus has to continue to deal with. It's self-centeredness. Let's just call it out. It's us looking more importantly at ourselves. It was the origin of the very first sin and it's continued throughout humanity. It just got passed down. Now, I'm not saying you should be hard on yourself. I'm not saying you should feel bad and like there's a shame. It's not about that. But we need to identify there's something that Jesus has to continue dealing with. And it starts to show up in his teaching. So he asked Peter, he's traveling with his disciples, they're in a really crazy place. And after he's done all these amazing things, he's asked Peter, who do people say that I am? Kind of an interesting question. Like, are people getting it? And the answer back was, some say you're Elijah, some say you're, you know, you're this or that, but okay, Peter, who, who do you say that I am? Peter being the vocal one, and Peter actually is the one like Mark interviewed for most of this gospel. Mark says to him, I believe that you're the Christ. I think as the reader, we get pretty excited. Somebody actually realizes this. But what gets revealed about Peter's response is he believes he's the Christ like in a nationalistic where he's going to provide for us kind of way. Like this is the guy who's going to make us free and no longer under Roman rule and everything in our life will become better. But Jesus says something so confusing so often after this confrontation, after this communication. He says this to them, don't tell people who I am. If you've ever read the Gospels, and Jesus does this amazing, have you ever wondered why he says that? 
Like, wouldn't it make more sense if everybody knew that the Jesus, the healer, the, the storm calmer, the, the person who's making everything right is here? We wonder why he says this. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Shouldn't everybody know? It's probably because the conclusions or the misunderstanding of who he needed to be, his purpose, was still not known or understood. He didn't want them to perpetuate the conditions of their own heart. I mean, that really becomes the question for us, is do we understand him? Let me read this from you, from, from uh, Scripture, part of that same story, Mark 8, 29 through 33. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, thou art the Christ. And then he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And he was rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating that matter plainly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he then rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Whew. One of my life goals is for Jesus to never call me Satan. Probably needs to happen. I probably shouldn't be rebuking Jesus. But there's a phrase in there that pierces my heart. Your mind on God's interest, but man's. I mean, that's... Friends, I mean, I, I sit with you in this. What are God's interests? Am I more interested in God's interests or man's interests? Just so you know, sometimes God convicts me in the middle of my own sermons, so I just pause for a sec. I mean, there's something significant there that we'll get to later because I need to finish. Whew, maybe. You know, what's so amazing is that there was another guy, probably one of the few at the very end of Mark, that saw Jesus for who he was. He, he was a pagan Roman centurion. Probably was maybe a part of beating Jesus. For sure his role was to make sure he died. And he was standing there. I mean, you can't get any further from a disciple than a pagan Roman centurion. I mean, they were, they were enlisted to inflict pain upon people. At the very end, he ends up saying this, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him as Jesus was on the cross, saw the way, that's just so fast, he just saw the way he breathed his last. He said, man, truly this man was the son of God. To truly know Jesus is to know him and to know the way of the cross. If we are relying on knowing the facts, or the details, or just like Jesus died, rose again, I get to be with him. We don't really know Jesus. I mean, really. To know Jesus is to know him and the way of the cross. It's not just what he did on the cross, it's also understanding that he called us into taking up our own cross. This is the part I kind of warned you about. You're like, I just like this other part. Following Jesus is a life of denying ourselves a life of living out the agape love for the benefit of other people. You're like, you don't get a lot of people into the club, Dale, if that's what you're offering them. Hey, what we're offering you is a chance to serve. See, that can't be our offer. It's Jesus' call. But when we disconnect ourselves from experiencing the cross, we think that Jesus' death and resurrection is just so that we can make our current life plan happen. And then our future is secure. If we think that the 
death and resurrection of Jesus is just so you can make your current life plan work. Like, that's good, so I get to do what I want to do. It's just not. And that's what they continue to do in the book of Mark. But here's something important. Each time there was a misunderstanding about Jesus and the cross, he clarified it with some kind of teaching. Following directly right after there was this whole, you're Satan, no, you're Satan kind of thing. He summoned, verse 34 in chapter 8, and he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. I know this isn't up there. I just wanted to keep reading. When he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus is making it a little harder right now. Oh, is he just making it clearer? Sometimes we think, oh, that wasn't clear. No, you just disagreed. It's pretty doggone clear what Jesus is saying here. The choice of self-centeredness that we saw in the garden was continuing. They think in the middle of Mark that following Jesus is about making my life happen, making it what I dream it to be. But it's not. It is so much more. We'll continue on. There's another story, Mark 9, 31. Whole nother situation. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. Hey, what, what were you guys discussing on the way? So he just tells them, your leader, your rabbi is going to be held captive by these men, and they're going to torture me. And then they're on this journey, and he's like, hey, what were you guys talking about? But they kept silent on the way, for they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. That is a model of self-centeredness. Jesus is going to die, and they're like, oh, that's scary. Hey, who do you think Jesus likes the most? He's like, maybe Peter's like, I'm pretty bold. I say things. I told him he was the Christ. I got the right answer. I'm an A-plus student. John's like, you know he loves me the most. I'd like it to hang out and put my head on his shoulder. He draws me near to him. Because when we feel uncomfortable and unclear, we suddenly draw back to like, huh, what does Jesus offer me? Hmm. And sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, verse 35, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last. Last of all and servant of all. And then taking a child, he set before him, he set him before them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And, whatever, and whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. Clarifying conversation. He's not simply saying don't talk about yourselves but like who are you helping? Who are you seeing other people to be? He reaches out to them. There's one more story. It takes place in Mark chapter 10. I'm sharing these with you ahead of time because we're going to get to this point. I just want to clear your lens a little bit of what we're looking for. Mark 10, 32. Once again, 
and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. They were actually traveling together, following him to go to his death. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. They were amazed about some things he just did. And those who followed him were fearful. (coughs) It's probably a good choice. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on, upon him and then scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. Did they get it this time? The power of self-centeredness is overwhelming, my friends, because this is their response. And James and John... The two sons of Zebedee came up to him, saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. There's a statement. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. Jesus is like, in a few days, I'm giving my life. And James and John are like, hey, don't tell anybody else. But we heard you say one time, whatever you ask in my name, that's what we get. So this is what we want. How cool would it be, Jesus, that for eternity, James can be on your left and John can be on your right. How amazing would that be? Jesus is like, there's a different way of living. There's a different way of responding. You see, there's something about that happens in our lives when we're like, hey, we have reserved seats. Self-centeredness leads us to this point where we're like, man, if I just know that I'm on your left and he's on your right, we're going to have a posture of confidence through the rest of our life that we really get something good. Of course, Jesus teaches right after this. He says this, but Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am being baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, all right, well, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, which is death. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am being baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left This is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Like, that's up to God. And hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. I love that. The rest of the disciples are like, dude, what are you talking about? Should be a table for 12. (laughs) And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, here it is, the teaching. You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave to all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay. Let you breathe a little bit. That was a lot of information. The reason I share that with you is because we have the opportunity as the reader in 2022 to have the big picture as we're seeing what unfolds. And there's a distinction between this book is about Jesus who came and did amazing things and then he died and then he rose again for my benefit to make my life happen. The clarifying thing is that Jesus didn't die and rise again just to make your life plans happen. He's inviting you into his life. He's inviting you into a cruciformed way of living. That the crucifixion actually affects how you live and how you think. To be his hands, to be his feet, to be the presence of him, being the agape love for other people. 
So as we look at the book of Mark and immerse ourselves in this, even what Rob was bringing up, we're going to do like a meditative midweek where we take one of the verses and just meditate on that verse to read it and go, what is God saying to me in this? As we're doing that, I want you to see that it is absolutely about our salvation and it's about being a disciple of him. What does it mean to really follow him? Which is to be a servant alongside of him, to live a selfless life. Now, this is a tough thing to hear in Silicon Valley because we're doers, we're achievers, we're do, we've done amazing things, we've accomplished amazing things. And what Jesus is asking you and he's asking me is like, follow me. Go with me as I go to the cross. Join me in that. Mark's details of what he said and what he did speaks to all of that. He speaks to all of this power. Where I want to land today just breathe a little bit and encourage you a little bit. And maybe I just need to insert myself and see where you fit. It is really easy for me to be self-centered. It just is. I'm pretty good at it. Some of you that I know, well, you're pretty good at it too. I just, and we hear so often like, take care of yourself, true. Self-care, true. Like, I'm, I shouldn't just drive myself in the ground as some kind of weird martyr, right? I'm intentionally struggling for Jesus. I'm pushing away his blessings. No, 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 I'm not doing that. What I'm doing is aligning myself to the death of Jesus. How do I do that? I serve. What does serving mean? It's simply meaning like I'm sharing the agape love with somebody else. I'm letting go of the instinct that I have in exchange for what God's asking me to do. The instinct I have as a sinful person is to go, you're doing this to me. The cruciformed, which is the crucified way of living, is how can I share love with you? It's hard. But that's what it means when Jesus says, here's the gospel. The kingdom of God is here. It's a different way of living.